Welcome to NYLA 2020 On Demand. This session was previously recorded for the NYLA 2020 virtual conference. It is available to you through December 31st, 2020. Please note, once viewed, each on-demand program is eligible for one continuing education credit. Links to materials and presenter contact information have been archived in a Google folder. The link to this folder can be... Welcome to NYLA 2020 On Demand. This session was previously recorded for the NYLA 2020 virtual conference. It is available to you through December 31st, 2020. Please note, once viewed, each on-demand program is eligible for one continuing education credit. Links to materials and presenter contact information have been archived in a Google folder and are made available after conference. Support files and documents can be found in session files below the program description. Any questions about the NYLA 2020 virtual conference digital platform can be directed to Christina at nyla.org or you can call 800-252-6952. Women's Leadership Panel, Overcoming and Preventing Burnout. It's sponsored by NMN and co-sponsored by LAMS, ULU, and RLRT. Without further ado, our presenters. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Women's Leadership Panel. My name is Ariel Hessler from the new members of NILA subcommittee, and I'll be the moderator for this presentation. Our subject today is overcoming and preventing burnout, a topic which already needed to be addressed for many librarians, but has taken on a new meeting in light of COVID-19 this year. I'm delighted to introduce you to our three panelists, Shakima S. Miller, Suzanne McCauley, and Samantha Morgan, who will be discussing this topic from three different viewpoints. Shakima Miller is the Outreach and Partnership Specialist for the Nassau Library System. In this role, she initiates and maintains active relationships with agencies serving and advocating for vulnerable populations and underserved communities in order to foster partnerships, promote collaboration, and broaden awareness of library services. Suzanne McCauley is the Assistant Director of the Pioneer Library System, which offers support and services to the 42 libraries in Ontario, Wayne, Wyoming, and Livingston counties. Suzanne started as a children's librarian and has held various positions in public libraries in New York and Pennsylvania, most recently serving as the director of the Clifton Springs Library. Samantha Morgan has only been director of the Adams Free Library in Jefferson County for a short time, three years, which uh, she has kept on her toes running the small rural library with every day offering something different. And our first speaker today is Shakima. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to talk about burnout in the lens of an individual or the employee experience. Sorry. So a quick assessment. Um, ask yourself, have you been feeling misunderstood, unappreciated by coworkers? Have you felt run down and drained of physical or emotional energy or have negative thoughts about your job, coworkers, or family? Are you easily irritated by small problems or by coworkers and your teams? Or do you feel that you're in the wrong organization or the wrong profession? Or that the organizational politics of bureaucracy frustrate you and your ability to do a good job? If you answer yes to many of these questions, you may be experiencing or in danger of experiencing burnout. So are you, oops, sorry. So are you feeling the burn? Corny, I know, but really, are you? Most people spend the majority of their waking hours working. And if you hate your job, dread going to work and don't gain any satisfaction out of what you're doing, it can take a serious toll on your life. Employee burnout is becoming more prevalent in the workplace and will continue to be an issue that affects companies if it goes unmanaged. At a global pandemic, which has greatly affected our lives, personally and professionally, and is blurring the lines between work and non-work, Adding that to the mix, and there's no telling where, what the costs and effects might be. A pre-COVID Gallup poll of 7,500 full-time employees found that 23% reported feeling burnout at work, very often or always, while an additional 44% reported feeling burned out sometimes. 
That's a whopping 67% of full-time employees that have felt burnout. First coined in 1974 by Herbert Freudenberger in his book, Burnout, The High Cost of High Achievement. Burnout was originally defined as the extinction of motivation or incentive, excuse me, or incentive, especially where one's devotion to a cause or relationship fails to produce the desired results. We now define burnout as a state of emotional, physical, and mental exhaustion caused by prolonged exposure to excessive stress. The World Health Organization classifies burnout as an occupational phenomenon, linking it to chronic workplace stress. However, jobs aren't the only source of chronic stress that cause burnout. People may also experience burnout in their personal lives, feeling overwhelmed, emotionally drained, and unable to meet constant demands of caring for a family member or raising a family may cause burnout in our private lives. Physical, mental, and emotional exhaustion and sleep disruption can be early signs of burnout, and each individual may manifest symptoms differently. Burnout is more than just fatigue. It's a feeling of disillusion, lack of motivation, and a feeling that all of your efforts are done in vain. Some symptoms of workplace burnout include feelings of energy depletion or exhaustion, increased mental distance from one's job, or feelings of negativism or cynicism related to one's job, and reduced professional efficacy. Causes of workplace burnout can include unfair treatment at work, unreasonable deadlines, unmanageable workload and lack of support from managers, 24-7 access to work through emails and texts, and expectations to respond at off hours, as well as doing work that's monotonous and unchallenging. Symptoms of personal burnout are the same as those of workplace burnout, but are experienced because of situations in our personal lives. Those exhibiting personal burnout may also feel a sense of failure and self-doubt, feeling helpless, trapped, and defeated, they may have detached feelings and feeling alone in the world or loss of motivation. Causes of personal burnout may include working too much without enough time for socializing or relaxing, lack of close supportive relationships, or taking on too many responsibilities without enough help from others and not getting enough sleep. Certain personalities may be more prone to burnout. Some examples include workaholics, those who work all the time and struggle with work-life balance. They will neglect self-care in order to get value from their work. People pleasers. These folks will put their own needs aside in order to make their managers happy. And the perfectionist, who strives for flawlessness and sets high performance standards as long with critical self-evaluations. If you identify with any of these personalities, be mindful of your work-life balance. So is burnout just a form of depression? No. While burnout and depression can exhibit similar symptoms, there is a difference between the two. With burnout, most problems are related to work and adjustments made in relation to work will typically help. So for example, if someone is given a vacation knowing that they will not have to worry about work or not have to worry about home, they'll be able to enjoy that vacation. However, with depression, other important treatments such as therapy or medication may be needed. So the depressed person will not be able to get up the energy or motivation to enjoy the vacation because more than rest is needed. Depression, excuse me, depression also has certain symptoms that burnout doesn't usually exhibit including low self-esteem, feelings of hopelessness, and suicidal thoughts. Burnout begins when we aren't given or don't give ourselves the appropriate means to recover from workplace stress. Trying to push through exhaustion and continuing as you have been will only cause further emotional and physical damage. 
ignoring burnout can lead to some serious health issues. Burnout has been attributed to type 2 diabetes, coronary heart disease, gastrointestinal issues, high cholesterol, and even death for those under the age of 45. Burnout is not like a cold. cold. It doesn't go away after a few weeks, unless you make some changes in your life. However, burnout is not inevitable and can even be reversed if individuals take steps to combat it. So what are things we can do to help with burnout? This is not an exhaustive list of remedies, but hopefully anyone who's feeling burnout or on the verge of it will find one of these suggestions helpful. Take time to relax. When we take time to relax, we counteract the effects of our body's stress response. Be sure to use breaks and vacation time. Breaks and vacation time are provided to give us a chance to get away from the stress of work and recharge. Make sure to take your vacation days. It's what they're there for. When taking a vacation, make sure you set yourself up so that you're not checking and responding to emails but are totally disconnected. Set boundaries. Drawing lines between our personal and professional lives is important for our mental health. Separate yourself from the office. Stop accepting calls and responding to emails when you reach home. Create a time when your work ends and home life begins and stick to that boundary and make sure others stick to that boundary as well. Exercise for fun. This is a method that I have incorporated and for me, it helps. I encourage you to try to get in at least 30 minutes or more per day, but don't force yourself to do something you don't enjoy. Try dancing, weightlifting, or just taking a walk. You can even break that up into short 10 minute bursts of activities. A 10 minute walk can improve your mood for two hours. I would also advise trying meditation or mindful breathing. When things get a little hectic, I like to smell the flowers, which means inhale and blow the bubbles. Exhale. And I thank my son's kindergarten teacher, Ms. Lauren Munoz, for this breathing exercise. Reach out to friends. We may feel like we are the only ones going through this or that we don't want to burden anyone with our problems. But when we reach out, you may find that there are others that are feeling the same way and you can come up with solutions together or just serve as support for one another. This is another method that I have incorporated to help me cope. I recently started a support group for parents of my local library association and being able to talk with them and know that they understand what I'm going through has been gratifying. It's definitely, gratif excuse me, it's definitely comforting to know that I'm not alone. And lastly, for my list, seek professional treatment. Sometimes things can get too overwhelming. If you feel your situation is getting out of control or it may be more than burnout, please seek advice from a professional. They can help you come up with a personalized treatment plan. And with that, I'd like to pass it on to our next presenter, Suzanne. Okay, so I'm going to be presenting today on the leadership side of burnout. Um, and this is for anyone who's maybe a you know, director, department head, supervisor, or has anyone reporting to them in any kind of capacity. I think that, um, you know, sometimes <laughs> with leadership and, you know, and I've been in a position of leadership for a while and I've been a good boss and I've been a bad boss. And when I was reporting to someone like I am now, I, you know, I've had good bosses and I've had bad bosses. Uh, right now I have an awesome boss, so I'm really lucky. But sometimes it seems to be operating, leadership operates in two extremes. You're either kind of like this skit from Saturday Live where they were doing a little bit of a spoof on Soul Cycle. So you have these instructors that are like, 
you are a delicate butterfly and we're going to ride our bikes to a meadow. Or you have people that are like, feel the burn, die, die on your bike. And I think with leadership, it's really trying to find this really, this great balance between the two of those. So you're motivating your team and you're leading your team, but you're not burning out your team. So we're gonna go through a couple of don'ts first. Um, and they're not many don'ts, but I think they're really important. And the first one is, you know, not attaching guilt to taking sick time, vacation time, PTO. Your team is entitled to that time. And if they're going to take it off, you have to let them take it off without making them feel bad about it, without making them feel guilty. Obviously, you're going to want to put some parameters in there. You know, if it's um, the summer, it's June, July, August, maybe your children's librarian can't take two weeks off to go on vacation. But, you know, she is, he or she, they are entitled to their vacation time and you have to let them have it. And when they leave for their vacation, you say, have a great trip. We'll see you in a week. We'll see you in two weeks. So don't make people feel bad about taking the time off that they need. This one is all caps because it's kind of like one of those ladder for the people in the back slides. But if somebody needs to take a day off to address some mental health, maybe they're stressed, they're run down, they're, you know, mental health day, everyone kind of jokes about them, but they are real actual sick days and people should be able to take their real actual sick days for this time off. They shouldn't have to take from their vacation bank. So um, whatever reason, if they're calling out um, you know, for a sore throat or a stomach ache or just a mental health day, it's sick time and they are entitled to that sick time. Another way you can prevent burnout is do not email nights and weekends. Um, it's the year 2020. All of our email servers, you're able to schedule emails to go out, and that is what I do. So make sure that you're scheduling. If it's 9 o'clock at night, instead of hitting send, schedule that to go out at like 9.30 or 10.15 the next morning. Don't stress people out by filling their inbox when it's their own personal time. Um, another way you could avoid, avoid burning out your staff is not to micromanage. Um, you know, it's really good to check in with them when they're working on projects or tasks. Don't hover, don't helicopter. And also remember that like your way is not the only way. So if the end result or the end product is still the same, you don't have to micromanage every step of how they got there as long as they produced what they needed to produce. So you know, just stop hovering around and let your team work. Don't say we've always done it this way or that way. Um, you know, be open to new ideas and new way of doing things, maybe new procedures for workflow. Uh, there's no one path forward. And, um, and if you find that members of your team always say, like maybe you're newer to the organization and you have members on your team that are always saying we've always done it this way or that way, um, try to just remove that from everybody's lexicon. Make sure nobody's using that phrase because it really, I think it does kind of burn people out because you want to try something new or they want to try something new and everyone's like, well, we've never done that. And it just feels really, really stifling. So make sure you and no one else is saying that. So those are the don'ts. Now we're gonna go over just a couple of do's. So you should always have your teams back if you want to avoid burnout. Um, I think this was always really important that you know a director advocates or you know supervisor advocates for their staff. Um, but I think this became really apparent during COVID. Um, so you know making sure, for example, that your organization has a good work from home policy. You know maybe you didn't have one before, and then COVID nineteen really highlighted the the need for this kind of a policy. So addressing those kind of policies that that are going to support your staff. Um, you know, and I also think that COVID highlighted the importance of the work that still needs to be done with ADA accommodations and reasonable accommodations for your staff, making sure that the workplace is comfortable for them. Uh, and even like the New York State, the new sick time law that's going into effect in January, this should be something that you're enthusiastically working with, um, with your board of trustees to make sure that your staff um, feels supported, they feel safe, they feel that the organization is behind them at all times. Pay attention to the hours that your staff is working. Um, if you notice that you know someone's supposed to leave at five every day and now they're staying till 5.30, they're staying till six, they're st staying till 6.30, not only this, could this be a violation of labor laws, depending on um, you know, if they're hourly or salary, but you also wanna make sure that they're not burning themselves out. So you really wanna keep on top of your staff and make sure that they're going home when they need to go home. And if they're staying really late, 
maybe their workload's a little heavy. Maybe you need to take something off their plate. Um, maybe you need to move a deadline for them. So just sort of monitor what your staff is doing and the hours that they keep. Not to micromanage, but to make sure that they are setting those personal boundaries for themselves, um, for their own mental health. Let your staff try new things. So if somebody comes to you with an idea, um, you know, sometimes you know it's totally not going to work, but sometimes it could work. It's just never been done before. So let them try something new. When I was the children's librarian at the Henry Waldinger Library in Valley Stream, we were really trying to get the um, the principals and the school administrators to get behind summer reading a little bit more. So I came up with this idea that the school that had the highest percentage of participation based on their enrollment in summer reading would get this really big trophy. We would call it the Waldinger Cup. And, you know, the, the director at the time was like, oh, I'm not really sure. I think that, you know, the school principals don't have time for summer reading. They don't care for summer reading. But you know what? Try it anyway. And we tried it. And the principals loved it because it really tapped into their, like, competitive side. And they wanted their school to have the trophy. So it became a really big thing. Our participation skyrocketed in summer reading that year. We had the schools, the, um, the school media specialists, the principals, the teachers all behind us. And 14 years later, and the Waldinger Cup is something that's still going on in that um, library community. So letting your staff try new things can really be successful. And even if it's not successful, you, you know, empowered your staff, you trusted your staff. And I think trying new things keeps people from feeling burned out. They're not doing the same routine every single day. Communication is really important. Um, and I think it's, you know, you should communicate often, but you should also communicate in different ways. I prefer email. I love email. I would rather just email somebody, but I know not everybody on my staff prefers email. So making sure that you are having those face-to-face -face conversations, you know, one-on-ones or group meetings, um, you know, maybe, you know, checking in by phone, maybe if they don't care for a Zoom meeting um, with today's circumstances, but just make sure you're always talking to your team because if they don't have any information and they're always kind of guessing it, it can make the, it can be exhausting it can make them feel burned out and if they're waiting for an answer on something if you don't have that answer just tell them communicate that you're still working on it and get back to them but just like that limbo that hanging that waiting it can really be tiresome for your staff include your staff in the decision making process and this is similar to communication but you know, your staff doesn't like to feel that things are happening to them, that they have no control. Um, you know, some things are going to be at that admin level. It is going to be director board. But if you're drafting new policies and new procedures, getting the feedback from the staff is really important. They're your front line, so they would know best what's going to work and what's not going to work. So, um, you know, if you do walkthroughs of the building, invite somebody on the staff, you know, from your staff to come along with you. You know, have them vet new policies. You know, just you know, make them feel like they're a part of your organization. And I think this was also highlighted during COVID-19 because there were so many people that didn't know, I don't know what's gonna happen. Am I gonna have to go back to work? Am I gonna have PPE? Am I gonna be exposed? So I just think that making your staff a part of those conversations and listening to them and soliciting feedback will help you make better informed decisions. Be consistent, um, and this is, you know, applying policies, procedures, your expectations. If things are constantly changing and the staff has to guess, like, is this going to be correct? Is this right? Am I doing the right thing? Uh, it could be really tiresome. They should have clear expectations laid out. Not to say that things sometimes don't abruptly change, you know, like all of a sudden there's a 75% work from home order from the governor. Yeah, we all have to change gears really quickly. But, you know, those day-to-day -day routines and expectations, they should be clearly laid out and defined for your staff and be consistent. Because always having to guess, second guess, redo, re-edit, it's really, it's really tiresome. And it can really wear down your staff and, and does take a toll on motivation. Change the scenery. I know right now this is a little bit of a struggle, but sometimes it's good to like get out of the office. If there's a bench outside your library, maybe have your one on one meeting there. Um, maybe, you know, have this, you know, a staff outing somewhere if you can, even just a picnic or a barbecue. Have a walking meeting. So maybe you just you know, do a lap around the block and just talk through, you know, some programming ideas. Just do something a little different than you sitting behind your desk and they're sitting at the other side. Sometimes just a change of scenery can really be refreshing for everybody on the staff. 
you want to celebrate the small stuff. Um, you know, you don't have to wait for like big, giant, giant events to happen at your library to celebrate. You know, not only birthdays, but even like library anniversaries. Um, you know, maybe have silly events like let's all wear slippers today. Let's have it be pajama day. It's let's all wear plaid today. Just doing really tiny, fun things. I think help keeps morale up and helps. Um, you know, just make it makes everybody a little excited to come to work that day. So just make sure that you aren't just waiting for some monumentous life-changing event to like bring in a cake you just try to do little things around you know along the way maybe once a month you do a special fun theme and it just makes everybody like yeah i can't wait to go to work today and wear my monster slippers make sure you're listening to your staff um sometimes you know someone on your staff will come to you with a problem um and they just really actually just want to talk through it. They're not necessarily looking for you to solve everything. And we're so quick, like we get into like problem solver mode and we want to cut them off and offer solutions and, you know, and, and clean things up as quickly as possible. But sometimes you really just need to sit there, stop talking and start listening. And, you know, that venting can make them feel better. It could help them work through an issue on their own. Uh, the other day I sat down with my boss and I was just going through all the things that I was working on and hit the end. He said, well, wh what do you need from me? And I was like, nothing, that was it. Like I just needed to like kind of work through um, this project I was on and I needed to talk it out and I was feeling really stressed. And once I got all that out and I saw what my solutions were, I just felt better. So sometimes we don't have to automatically kick into like problem solving. Let me give you all the answers right now and talk over them but sometimes we could just sit back and listen to our staff and I think it just makes them feel really valued if you're letting them have that space to come and talk to you about what's going on um, with their workload you want to recognize the signs of burnout in your staff. So those slides that Shakima had they were great um, the assessment one and the symptoms you know if you, sometimes people don't recognize what's going on with themselves. But if you start to see maybe changes in mood, changes in behavior, changes in um, work productivity, you know, maybe keep an eye on those and address them with your staff. Maybe there's something that you can be able to do to help them. Maybe, you know, whether they're struggling inside work or outside, you know, um, keep an eye on that because if they're burned out from something that's outside work, that's going to impact work and vice versa. So you just want to kind of keep an eye on your staff and know when you might need to step in and help them out. Remind your staff about the, their EAP. So if you offer an employee, employee assistant program, make sure your staff knows that it's there. Sometimes it's like we sign up in the beginning of the year and we sort of forget about it. But, you know, it can help them resolve both personal and professional problems, you know, especially issues with child care, finances, legal. So if your organization offers an EAP, remind your staff it's there and give them all the information. If you get that administrator email from them, like once a week or once a month, make sure you're forwarding that out to your staff. And if your organization doesn't offer this, it might be a really um, good opportunity to look into it for the new year. So just a couple of friendly reminders as we move forward. We aren't life-saving doctors. I know uh, COVID made us have that big library debate, essential versus essential essential. You know, we do really important work at libraries and we are invaluable to our communities. But, you know, mistakes in, in our world, they're okay. And if a deadline needs to get pushed back, it's okay. You know, let's not, you know, grind each other to, you know, down. Let's not burn each other out. Like it's all going to be okay. Uh, remember that your goals are not everybody's goals. So you may be so super passionate about the library. You want to eat, breathe, and sleep the library. You want to like live in the library. It's amazing to you. That's fine if that's your goal, but not everybody on your staff is going to feel that way. Someone just may want to punch in, do their job, punch out, and that's great, and that's fine. And you shouldn't you know, evaluate or assess their performance based on them not having that shared goal. As long as they're coming and doing their work, and they're doing a good job, that's fine. Like they don't need to be you and you don't need to be them. And lastly, a happy team, oh, second to last, sorry. Happy team makes you look good. So I think we all remember the Mighty Ducks. And when Gordon Bombay was being super terrible to everyone on his team, the kids were like, we hate this team, we hate this coach. And they were 
they were losing and they didn't care and they didn't even want to show up. And then Gordon Bombay has that talk with Hans, the ice skate man, and he has a change of heart and he approaches it completely different and he's happy and his team is happy and the team wins and it's a wonderful ending. And I just feel like if you're happy and you're projecting that on your team and your team is happy, they're going to perform better and then that makes you look good. So it's just better if everybody in the organization is happy. People that, um, if you have a staff that is tired, they're burned out, they're stressed, they're exhausted, um, it's going to make, you know, their performance is not going to be great. It's going to make the organization look bad. And that all falls on you as like the director or the supervisor. So you want a happy team. Um, you want a high performing team. And now it's my last slide. <laughs> uh, and just remember, you know, back to, I guess, Shakima's slides and Samantha's slides coming up. Make sure that you're taking care of yourself. Because again, if you're stressed or burned out, you're going to be projecting that onto your staff and taking it out on them. So you need to make sure that you are in the right frame to lead your team. So if you need to take your mental health days, take your mental health days. If you need to turn off your email at 10 o'clock at night, you know, turn it off. There's no reason for you to be checking it at that time. And I am super guilty of that. Um, you know, take your vacation, um, do all those things that are going to take care of you so then you can turn around and be a good leader for your team. And I do have some follow up reading, but this these slides will be uploaded so you can refer back to this later on. But it is just a couple of things if you wanted to read more a little bit about burnout and then also about, you know, empowering and leading your organization and not stressing your team out. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Samantha. Okay, so I'm doing burnout with the small library in COVID-19. Um, so lessons that I learned as being a director of a small library is that burnout is very real and it comes on fast because as a small library with a staff of only two, it comes on really fast. And I know what it's like to work all the hours by myself. Um, I had to learn to pace myself also in that and, and like schedule out and tasks and to do um and, and i've also learned how to delegate tasks to the assistant and it's not like i'm pawning off work to the assistant but it's something that i figured that she could do that would make my life a whole lot easier um one of the biggest things i learned is do not take home work with you um, I was always taking homework and doing stuff at home with the library and then feeling like I was about ready to give up. Um, give yourself a break. Don't take the work from home with you. And I know with the pandemic, this has changed and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and find yourself a distraction from work when you're home, um, whether it's reading a book you like, binge watching TV, whether you're Netflix, Disney Plus, Hulu, whatever streaming service you like. Um, I like to play around on Pinterest to find new ideas um, in the time of COVID. This little meme, like totally summed up my time working from home and I was going nowhere like probably everybody else was and um it wasn't in the library except for essential stuff and that was only at the beginning and the rest of the time in home just um and trying to keep stuff going and work from home this was like everybody's dream in the beginning and some people realized that that really wasn't what they thought it would be um and for me at the beginning of the pandemic it was complete chaos i had probably like everybody else had no clue what i was doing no guidance on anything and i was um kind of working when i felt like it not um let's see not having a set schedule and, and then and as time went on there was i structured the day and set a specific time for work hours and, and home hours and when i was like not doing work and i didn't check email i didn't do anything 
that like drives me crazy. Um, when we transitioned back to being open for limited service, it was a change of scenery. It was good to get out of the house um, in some sense of normalcy because it was actually a set schedule where you knew this is where you would be at this time instead of like everything jumbled together for um jumbled together um and then everybody's had to adapt to new regulations and procedures in the library that we all had to come up with like sort of on the fly with some guidance some no guidance on it um it was back to a set schedule so i know which days that um i was going to be in the library what times i was going to be at the library so it was so much more vivid than working from home and, and if i get bored with the task i just leave it and change to something else to keep my mind um fresh going on and then these are just some ways that i've dealt with burnout um in my short time as director at my library and um, learn to take a step back and reevaluate what is going on, what's been working, what hasn't been working um, and along the way to like talking with my assistant and through everything and take time for self, um, which we all need to do um, and focus on positive and then just read for fun, watch TV, movies, like I said, literally just do nothing, just hang out and chill and, um, and do whatever feels nice. Nobody can tell you you can't do nothing. Sometimes it just takes a little bit just to do nothing and you feel good. And, um, and search for new ideas, like use Pinterest and the internet and attend conferences and, um, and go to different webinars. And, um, and I hold conversations with myself all the time. Sometimes I give myself really good advice. And sometimes I'm talking out loud with something actually um, it makes you think about it in a different way. And, and baby Yoda, that's a picture of my baby Yoda. And, um, and I love looking at the memes on Pinterest and um and just seeing what's out there people have been really funny like with the memes and stuff and sometimes you just need a little bit of fun um a little bit of laughter in this time when we all feel isolated and that is my last slide um and it will be posted for everybody to see Um, so I think we had some time for questions, um, or Becky, are we out of time? No, you can, um, if you have some questions. Yeah, absolutely. We'd love to have some questions. You're good. Okay. Um, I don't know if there's anyone attending uh, who had questions. I wrote down a couple if you guys wanted to just discuss whatever I ask. Um, so one was, um, I think, uh, Suzanne, how you were talking a lot about environments, and it sounded like... Basically, if you're a good leader, you're hopefully fostering a good work environment. And I feel like we kind of all know that a negative work environment will cause burnout much faster, obviously. Um, do you or do any of you have suggestions on how to improve a negative work environment? Because sometimes that's really hard. Like once once the workplace feels toxic, it can be really hard to try to improve it, um, especially on an individual level when you might feel powerless, but also on an administrative level when you might have people saying, well, it's always been done or something like that. I was wondering if any of you had suggestions on maybe like small steps that you could take. You know, from the leadership perspective, I think um, you have to be okay with people being a little upset with you when you make changes and you have to kind of, and it sounds almost counterintuitive, right? Like I'm going to be the enemy for a little bit to create this positive work environment. But I think change does scare people, especially if you're new to the organization and you start implementing these changes. Um, you know, 
people are just going to be upset and sometimes they don't see the long game they don't see what you're trying to accomplish um so you know so there's definitely going to be a little, little resistance but i think if you stay the path you know you realize that comes some concessions and some compromises have to be made sometimes things might not happen as fast as you want to but i think like slow and steady progress towards changing the culture towards you know trying new things um just making sure that you're always communicating though if somebody you know if someone who's been working at the library for 20 years comes in and you completely like rearrange this whole section of the library overnight like that's really jar even if it's better even if it's more browsable like it could be really jarring it could kind of be upsetting so just make sure that you're just keeping those lines of communication open um and again involving your staff in these changes like maybe you know you ask for some opinions first you're having them do it with you. I remember I did a big shifting project at um, at Clifton Springs and I reversed, you know, the nonfiction and the large print and, um, you know, but I had the staff do it with me. It was a project we did together and, you know, even though maybe there was a little resistance at first, at the end we saw circulation numbers go up. We saw our patrons that used the large print section, they were able to navigate the, you know, the stacks easier. So I just think that you have to be okay with people being a little upset with you. But as long as you keep plugging away and you involve, involve them, I think eventually you'll get where you want to be um, as far as implementing like maybe a, some positive changes in the work culture. Thanks. I don't know if I, anyone can add. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say maybe from an individual point of view, um, if you feel like you're working in a negative work environment and you're trying to make it positive and maybe your boss is not up to that point, but you know, you can do the little things for yourself um so like decorating your office like some of the happy things that suzanne was saying you can do for yourself and not have to necessarily have the um whole boss involved um so like you know the the de los muertos is coming up so you'll put up some decorations in your office and then you'll get people to kind of join in and cut because this is what i've done this is what we've done in the past in other offices that i've been in and we kind of cut things out and decorate our office and it's collaborating and working with your team and hopefully your boss will see that and bring it back in um but then also knowing that if it's just too negative and you can't take it leave <laughs> Yeah, I think that's an important point. And like sometimes it's it's almost like you're you know you oh you're not happy, then just leave. And that could be like almost seem like you're speaking from a place of privilege, like I can afford to leave my job. And but there does come a point where I think that sometimes a work environment is not a good fit for you and you do have to cut your losses. I've definitely stayed at workplaces longer than I should have. And um, to this day, like, <laughs> you know, there's things from that workplace that will like, um, I think that's part of the reason I still check my email late at night because that was ingrained in me at that workplace. And it's like, I always have to kind of work through that. And, um, but I think that, you know, if it's more than burnout and it's a situation that's not going to be remedied, like it is time to start looking. It is t time to start getting out. Um, you know, I've said to people that work in sort of toxic places, like your workplace doesn't have to be this way. There's other workplaces like the grass can be greener. And, you know, it's hard to think about starting over and looking for a job, especially right now. Right. Like, you know, the workforce, we will feel thankful to have our jobs at the moment. But um, you know, sometimes don't be afraid to take that leap and move on to better things. Um, so I have another question. This is kind of pivoting from our focus on librarians, but um, right now it seems like everyone in the country is dealing with, or the world is dealing with burnout, especially with, you know, homeschooling or virtual schooling um, and job losses. So do you have any suggestions for how libraries can help our patrons deal with burnout? Um, like I know my library has a, like a homeschool collection now that they just launched. If you have any other ideas um, that you think people could bring back to, I guess, help patrons learn these things that we're talking about now. Um, does that, I can jump in or does someone else want to go first? <laughs> I think, um, you know, it's right now, you know, especially in libraries, we want to say yes, we want to be helpful, we want to do so much for our communities. And, you know, especially in New York, right, we have like these limitations of what we can do. We have like capacity levels in our building and we have social distancing requirements, but thinking of the creative ways that we can say yes to our communities. So, you know, I know, um, you know, virtual and online programming was really helpful. Some of our communities do have issues though with broadband and internet access. 
So just thinking of the creative workaround so you can meet as many patrons as you possibly can. Are you able to have programs outside? Is there adequate space where you could spread out? Um, are you able to make you know, your online resources accessible from outside the building? A lot of people did that with like their ancestry collections. Um, you know, I mean, their ancestry subscriptions, you know, people were able to access them from outside the library, you know, boosting those, uh, you know, ebook, audiobook collections, promoting those online resources so people don't feel abandoned by their library. Like, you can't come visit us in our physical space, but look at this virtual or online space that we have. So I just think it's trying, instead of like focusing on what you can't do and all the no's that we have to say right now, focusing on maybe what we can do and maybe some outside the box or creative solutions. Great. Um, I just, maybe my last point is I really liked your phrase you used just now that was creative ways we can say yes, because my other question was going to be how um, sometimes burnout, uh, preventing burnout means saying no, but also not really just saying no to anything, but prioritizing what you can say yes to, what you can say no to. And I just liked your phrase creative ways we can say yes, because it, it kind of shows that there's levels of saying yes. It's not just whatever you asked of me, I can do right away. There's maybe I can do that, but it's you know, gonna maybe take time or I can do that to a lesser degree. Um, but uh, I, I think my last question would be, um, do any of you have tricks to how you prioritize things? Um, I know especially Samantha, I'm sure you have to prioritize a lot because it's just you and one other person. Um, so is it like a budget thing? Is it maybe just time? Is it just deciding for yourself what you have time for? Any of you wanna jump in on that? Well, I take one day a week, usually like a Friday or Saturday when I'm working to kind of think about what to do for the next week. And I have a notebook on the desk where I communicate with my assistant. And if I'm thinking of something, I say, hey, can you get this done on your next shift? So she doesn't always have to call me or email because she knows she doesn't want to bug me like on my non work day. Um, so like we just communicate by notebook and, um, okay, great. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I do the same. I have a notebook where it has, um, with, it's so funny with all of this digital stuff that we have, I still use paper and pen to kind of prioritize. Um, but also it's important for me to think about, um, what our organization's priorities are, and then also talk to my boss about what their priorities are. And that's how I personally um, help to prioritize um, my work day. Yeah, I still use pen and paper too. I feel like it makes me feel like I have more control. Like if I'm writing it down, like I will enter things, like I have a Google calendar and, um, but, yeah, I just, yeah, my little to-do list, my, my projects, I do like to write, I feel like I just, I have mastery over it if it's written down, like, I don't, but um, yeah, I think, you know, I definitely, it's hard to, you know, you have to prioritize everything feels so intense and so important right now, but I also think um, just to keep myself from feeling stressed or burned out, like sometimes I'll throw in, like, instead of doing like high level tasks, high level tasks, high level tasks, like I'll throw in, in the middle of that, like something fun and kind of silly and maybe really didn't have a deadline or it wasn't pressing, but it just kind of breaks that up. And I feel like, you know, like doing maybe like creating some of our social media posts, um, you know, in Canva, I'll just take a look. And that's not like this pressing urgent issue to do so, like an owl waving at a library, but it just feels fun and it feels silly. And then I kind of like regroup and I have a little snack while I'm doing it. And then I go back to those tasks. So I'm not ignoring those priority tasks, but I think sometimes taking a little break from them makes me feel fresh to go back and tackle them again and stay on my, on my deadline or my timeline better yeah that is a good point like prioritize your breaks as well it's not just yeah. tasks that you have to do but make sure that you are taking time to just step away from the computer for a second um step away from work for a second to just clear your mind for a little bit yeah i don't i don't think a lot of us i'm, I'm just learning how to do that like i can sit at my desk all day and then not forget that you know, Shakima, you have a life outside of here. So, uh, yeah, it's prioritizing your time to yourself too. Especially when you're working from home too. I think it was really easy to log on at nine o'clock. And then like the next thing you, like, and I would wander downstairs for a sandwich and come back up to my desk. But the next thing I do, it's like six o'clock and you know, you're just, and you're like, oh, it's getting dark outside. And so it's really important 
um, I think, especially now to make sure you're taking those breaks and that time for yourself and prioritizing your breaks. So I think that's like in the office, you know, if there's people here, you always have someone you could just pop in and say hello to. There's some distraction, but at home, I think we're like locked in our like home offices and we're hyper focused and um, we're, the whole day goes by sometimes and you don't take your eyes off your screen. So yeah, I think that's really important. Um, I think my last thing is is less of a question, but more if you have comments on it. One thing I've kind of learned recently is self care isn't just like bubble baths and candles. Like you know, Shakima kind of went over how you know exercise. You need to exercise. It gets your heart rate up, and that makes you it releases endorphins. You know, um, and one thing I listened to it was on a podcast, and I I wish I could credit who it was. I don't remember, but it was about a publisher or it was an author, and they had learned. Um, uh, for about it was about procrastinating, and one of the things they had learned was, if I wait on this, will it make the situation better? And if the answer was no, then they would try to do the task right away. And I know I'm very guilty of procrastinating, and it's one of those things where I think procrastinating can be disguised as preventing burnout. Like people think, well, that's stressing me out, so I'll wait till tomorrow or I'll wait till next week. And then what they don't realize is when you do that with ten different things, that starts to become what's burning you out because you're you're anxious about it um so i just wanted to add that in there if you had any comments like sometimes it's just even making a doctor's appointment that you've been avoiding you know that self care now you don't have to worry about it it's done so um yeah things like that <laughs> Yeah, there's like a meme that always makes me laugh when I see it on Instagram, but it's something like, oh, it took me five minutes to do that task I was putting off for six months. And yeah, it's like, exactly. true, you know, like sometimes we put off these things that maybe aren't our favorite things to do, but it, it ends up hanging over you for this period of time. And it could be a task that literally takes five minutes, but like it kind of, it slowly burns away and eats away and it's like filed in, your, in the back of your head and you're always sort of thinking about it. So even though you pushed it off, I think it still could be there eating away at you. And, um, yeah. you know, you put these things off thinking you give yourself some breathing room, but they're secretly there. Right? So, yeah. And I think list making helps too, because if you write down something, I feel like it loses some power over you because yeah. you're like, like you said, it's, it's, you feel like you're in control when you write it, you know, it's like, I, now it's less scary. It's this thing that I wrote down. Um, yeah. I also like Samantha, how you talked about delegating, because I think that's also something that a lot of, uh, I think women in particular struggle with, we feel like we should be able to, we have to be able to do everything. Um, and, and we feel like if we ask someone else to do it, we're like pawning it off on them when really, especially in someone like, you know, your position, somebody they're like, you're the director and, and this is what the person's there for is to help you, you know? Um, so I think that's also really important for people to learn that if you can delegate, you should delegate. So. Yeah. I think a lot of times like women in leadership feel like, um, if they, can't do everything or they delegate something it's a sign of weakness like mm -hmm. you know but meanwhile if i think in many instances if a man in leadership were to delegate a project or a test they'd be like what a good boss he's empowering everyone <laughs> around him but it's like you know but as a woman you're like oh if i don't do that maybe they think i'm not up to this job you know i'm not up i, I can't do everything and um then that's not true it be, you know delegation is a huge part of leadership and you know not only taking things off your plate but giving your staff meaningful work to do and making them feel invested and empowered yeah, i went to this luncheon um a couple years ago and this woman she won the uh the athena award up in rochester and she was saying you you can have everything just not all at the same time so it's like maybe you can do everything but you can't do everything at the same time so delegating those tasks and putting things on other people's plate um it's not weakness it's being a leader and i i am so guilty of that so i think that was such a great reminder so thank you <laughs> yeah i um that's actually maybe our last question should be um how do you think um it's because this is a women's leadership panel and kind of speaking to what you just said um especially for women, um, if you have families at this point too, um, burnout I think is such a big issue because um, I know at my own library, we've had at least one person who had to stop working because she needs to be home because she decided to homeschool. Um, and even those that aren't homeschooling, they're still maybe their children are doing virtual and they're just lucky enough that they happen to be in high school and can stay home that one day where they need to do virtual. Um, but uh, I was wondering if any of you um, could speak to or wanted to speak to um, kind of the family life balance, the family work balance, um, or just life to work balance. <laughs> I think we've touched on it a little, but um, how to maintain that. And then um, also just kind of, if you wanted to expand on what Suzanne kind of just said with um, 
the pressures that women feel in general, I think, and how that comes with this higher stress and burnout and how to kind of maybe let it go. That's a lot, I know, I'm sorry. So. <laughs> no, well, I was just reading yesterday, I'm like trying to find it on my phone now, but I was just reading yesterday this article on CNN and they were saying how women are currently leaving the workforce in droves because either, you know, it's due to layoffs because a lot of women tend to work in like hospitality and they're being furloughed, or it's because, you know, someone, they have, someone has to now stay home with the kids and it's, you know, just falling traditionally to women, um, whether they're not making as much as their partner or it's just like, just that natural, like, oh, okay, well, the woman's gonna stay home, and, um, and you know, I, you know, and I get, I got nervous reading this article. I'm like, is this setting us back? You know, you know, we're finally like, women are in the workplace, and we're a force in the workplace, and we're getting these positions of leadership, and now, like, is the pandemic gonna be setting us back a little bit, um, in in the workforce? But, you know, I'm really fortunate because I have my kids are older, um. So like, you know, I have a 17, 12 and 10 year old and my 10 year old's going to school four days and the other two are doing a, more of a hybrid two days, but they can be left alone. Um, I just go in, check to make sure they're doing their homework, everything submitted and they are kind of, I'm lucky that way. When they were younger, um, you know, to make that time for me so I wasn't burned out, I would get up at like four in the morning to either go to the gym or go running and that was terrible. And I was so glad when I was finally able to like sleep till six, but um, you know, but finding that time was really important to me. Like it was important that I prioritize like having that hour to myself, no matter what time of day it was. Um, and I'm lucky because my husband is very supportive. Like if I'm gonna go do, I kind of just tell him I'm gonna go do this. And it's not like, you know, um, it's not like a big thing. It's just, you know, so I'm, I'm lucky in that respect, but I think it's just really important that women try to find whatever their circumstances right now, whether they have to reduce their hours, whether they have to, you know, leave the workforce, they're still finding some time during the day. Like Shakim said, even 30 minutes, like just finding that time during your day, that's just you, that's your interest. That's something that you're passionate about or something that you enjoy. That's not related to your kids or homework or your job or, you know, the stack of papers that you have to sign the bills, like just something that you just totally love and enjoy and just have that 30 minutes to yourself every day and find it whenever you can, but make yourself a priority no matter what your work home situation is. Yeah, I, um, I right now am fortunate enough to um, be at an organization that is very supportive. Um, so I'm still working from home. Um, and my position affords me to be able to do my work from home. Um, and I also have a five-year-old that just started kindergarten and we decided to do virtual learning with him. And so it, it was something that stressed me out up until the school year, like how am I going to be able to work and make sure that this five-year-old is learning um, well. And then I also have a four-year-old who I am teaching. Um, so it's, it, I mean, this is what maybe three weeks in, um, and I'm starting to find a balance of, you know, when I log him on, making sure he's paying attention, I'm going to do my work in that time. And his, we're, we're on one desk, so he's on the other side, I'm on one side, and then my daughter, little girl, has a separate desk. Um, and then when my son takes his break to have to do his homework, then that's learning time for my daughter. So I'm figuring out ways of doing it. Um, but it, it is, it, as I'm talking to other parents, it is just so funny how all of this, even when you have partners, all of this falls on the woman to make these decisions. And so that's that added stress. And it's like people, and particularly like a man, it's like, how do you do this? And I'm like, well, when you have no choice but to do it, you figure out a way. And that clearly lets me know, like, you don't, <laughs> someone else is doing that. You don't have to make that decision. You don't have to worry about it. And, you know, just like Suzanne said, trying to find time. So I, I try to find time in my day to, you know, the thing for me is try to get a, a workout in. And what the, the biggest thing for me is not only finding time, but I think for a lot of women too, is not feeling guilty about having that time to yourself, about saying, child, I love you, or husband, I love you, or, or partner, I love you, but I need this time to myself please let me have it and and in actually enjoying it and not feeling bad about oh my god this is something i could have been doing a craft with my child or 
baking or watching a movie with whomever. Like, it, I'm still learning that process of not feeling guilty about taking time for myself. Because if you don't take time for yourself, how can you take care of someone else? When you're burned out, how can you take care of someone else? I think that's the most important thing that we have to remember um, is that we have to take care of ourselves. There's that yes. quote, like you can't pour from an empty cup. You can't pour from an empty vessel. Yeah, it's exactly that. Yeah. Um, I also think um, both of you kind of touched on having support too, because, um, you know, Suzanne, you talked about your husband and then uh, Shakima, you also talked about the parent group that you found really helpful. And I think that's also really helpful for people because maybe you don't have your parents living nearby to help with childcare, but, um, you know, Suzanne talked about EAP. You could maybe have someone to talk to, or you can find if there's a parent group, or find your local library if you don't work at it. <laughs> if your local library has something, you know, um, and uh, and try to find those supports because um, you know we're not we're not all Athenas. <laughs> we're not all. Uh, I don't I don't know if they exist anymore. You know, everyone needs help. So I think that's a really good point. All right. And unless anyone has anything else they want to add. Okay, I think we're good. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. This was really excellent, and I'm so proud of it. And that um, new members was able to have all three of you come and talk about this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. That was that was great, Shakima. I felt like you were saying my life story as I was listening. I also have a kindergartner, and it is it's rough. So. <laughs> Um, this concludes the NYLA 2020 On Demand Program, Women's Leadership Panel, Overcoming and Preventing Burnout. We hope you continue to take advantage of all the On Demand and live programs the NYLA 2020 Annual Virtual Conference has to offer. Thank you for helping us make this the best virtual conference ever.